it's the obligatory 1203. Um, so we're going to begin. So first off, um, thank you so very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate your time, and we appreciate you um, willing to, to join us to learn about the plight of whales and other marine species. My name is Adrian Esposito. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Campaign for the Environment. I'm joined by my colleagues, Julie Tai, the Executive Director of the New York League of Conservation Voters, and Fred Zalkman, the Director of New York uh, Offshore Wind Alliance. And uh, we put together this program because of the outpouring of questions and concern and interest that the public has regarding the whale deaths have, that have been occurring along our shores since 2016. And that is a very serious issue and needs to have serious discussion. Um, so we put together a compilation of experts who could help bring together some science and some facts and some information that'll help us uh, towards answering the public's questions. But before we begin, I just wanna um, introduce uh, Julie Tai and Fred Zalkman and ask them if they'd like to say a brief opening hello. Julie? Hi, thank you so much, Adrian. I'm happy to be here today. I'm Julie Tai, I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. We are a statewide environmental organization that seeks to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment, and particularly focusing on fighting climate change through clean transportation, clean buildings, clean energy, including offshore wind. Um, we want to make sure that things are done responsibly, and we want to make sure that citizens and New Yorkers have the opportunity to ask questions and to hear more about facts, because we know there's a lot of disinformation out there related to uh, offshore wind, and to make sure that we are holding the offshore wind industry accountable and advancing things in a way that's responsibly, uh, environmentally responsible. So really happy to be here today, really excited for uh, to hear from our expert panel um, to, um, to our three panelists. So thank you so much, and I will leave it at that. And Fred Zaltman. Thanks, Adrian, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd also like to join in welcoming you to this uh, whale webinar where we'll hear from uh, the scientific community on the root causes of the um, unusually high number of whale mortalities that have been recorded along the Eastern seaboard since 2016, and to learn more about what measures can be taken to protect these majestic creatures. Um, again, my name is Fred Zalkman. I'm the director of the New York Offshore Wind Alliance. We're a coalition of the world's leading developers of offshore wind, environmental NGOs, and organized labor all joined together to support a robust, and I wanna emphasize responsible offshore wind market in New York State. Uh, I wanna thank you all for joining, especially uh, want to thank our excellent panel of subject matter experts, and most of all, you for coming here uh, to learn, uh, to listen, and have an open mind. Uh, unfortunately, uh, much of what has been disseminated in the social media about these whale mortalities is neither uh, factually uh, accurate or evidence-based. Indeed, the linkage with offshore wind is either misinformed or deliberately false or misleading designed to slow the growth of this nascent clean energy industry. So today we, we hope to set the record straight. Uh, thank you again to uh, Citizens Campaign for the Environment and uh, New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Adrian. So again, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we had to turn off the chat function there are hundreds of people on this webinar right now, and we think a chat function with hundreds of people would get a little unruly. Um, but please put your question and answers in the Q&A section. Um, we did have over 600 people register for this forum, and the numbers are keep going up for participants as I'm watching it right now. If we can't get to your question at the end, please do not get uh, take it personally. We're going to do the best we can. Each of our presenters will have 10 to 12 minutes to present, and then we're gonna do a panel discussion um, with your questions. 
So let's begin. I just want to frame uh, today's discussion before I introduce our esteemed panel members. So um, we're going to bring this up here. Okay. It's called Whale Tales and Whale Facts because many people have a genuine love of these majestic marine creatures, and it is our responsibility to protect them. Little bit of good news. Uh, we do have anecdotal, but as Megan uh, recalled from the uh, DEC will tell us, we don't have long-term data, at least not in New York, but we do have anecdotal data uh, about more whales being in our vicinity. So for instance, uh, we know that the Gotham Whale, which is a science-based nonprofit organization, they documented 260 mostly juvenile humpback whales uh, in the New York City area, and that was just last year. A decade ago, they only documented five. So we are seeing more humpback whales. Um, I think many of us go to the beach these days. We've seen them breaching from the shores of Long Island. Uh, and that is different than it was 10 years ago. Why is that? Well, one thing that many scientists uh, believe is a factor is New York State passed a law in 2019 protecting menhaden. What's menhaden? Well, they're also called bunker fish. And we passed a law in New York State to prevent what's called purse scenes. Those are the giant nets uh, used by industrial fishing operations to kind of rake the bottom lands and, and capture the menhaden. They're called bunker fish, which is bait fish, and there's a big market for them. So what happened? Well, next slide. The law was a success. Menhaden have come back to New York waters. Uh, they got the memo somehow that if you come to New York, uh, you will not be captured in a scene. But um, this is a little bit blurry. We apologize for that, but this is an overhead aerial view. That's a whale in the middle there, uh, as you can see from the fins, the white fins, and it's in the middle of a Menhaden school and it's happily feeding. So this type of fish and food sauce is very important for our marine species. The humpback whale, unu the, sorry, humpback whale unusual mortality event, as you can see from this map, has been occurring since 2016. It didn't just start this year or last year, but rather 2016. And you can see it's not unfortunately just limited to one geographic area. It's been up and down the East Coast and even some areas on the West Coast. This is only humpbacks, although there has been an increase in other whales such as minke whales as well. So we just wanted to give you this as a visual to understand the range uh, and the breadth of what we are seeing and what's been uh, classified as the unusual whale mortality event along the Atlantic coast. One other tiny bit of good news, uh, well, this wasn't good news. This was a pretty tragic event, but many people on Long Island remember the Mauritius whale stranding that occurred in 2016. This was not, the whale was actually, I don't think it was sick, but Rob Giovanni would know better than I would, but it actually just got unfortunately captured in a cove Tide went out, whale stranding occurred, everyone tried, but we could not save the whale. But this incident led to a more developed and a more coordinated whale response for future strandings. We have to keep in mind the impact of what's called ghost gear. Ghost gear is uh, equipment left in the ocean, fishing for, from commercial fishing operations. It either was left there, abandoned, or was lost in a storm, or was actually in use, and unfortunately, whales ran into it. What happens is the whales and even dolphins become entangled in this ghost gear. This uh, top picture and the bottom one are pictures from a 2020 event where NOAA uh, representatives and the Coast Guard had to go into uh, the waters and actually work really hard to disentangle the whale which they did, it was took many days, it took a lot of brave people doing it, but that's a success story. There's a right whale right now off of Cape Cod that's entangled in commercial fishing gear. Um, it's not looking very promising, but they are working to disentangle it, 
right now, but um, the seas are high, the weather is not cooperating, and it's a challenge. Last but not least, we have to remember the issue of ship strikes. We know that uh, there is an increase in ship strikes and whale deaths, something uh, our expert uh, Rob Giovanni will talk more about. So with that, I just wanted to frame this discussion. We've heard a lot of speculation about what is going on with whales and whale deaths. We understand people want answers. We all want answers. That's what the science and the facts have to drive us towards. So we've put together, I think, a great uh, forum today. We have with us Megan Ricard, who is a marine biologist with the Division of Marine Resources for the New York State DEC. We have Dr. Erica um, Staderman, who's a PhD scientist with BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. Her research is in sound and acoustics in water. And we have Rob DiGiovanni, who's the executive director and chief scientist for AMCs. And Rob has 33 years of work um, protecting whales, doing necropsies on whales and responding to whale strandings. So we hope that uh, this is a beneficial and educational program. We're gonna start today with Megan Ricard from the New York State DEC, who's gonna talk to us about data that the DEC has accumulated over three years or more on whales in the New York Bay and coming by our waters. Megan? Can you see those slides okay? Yes, we can. Okay. You're, you're, you're good to go. All right. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm Megan Ricard. I'm a marine biologist with the Division of Marine Resources. And as Adrian said, I'm going to be presenting on the DEC's whale monitoring program and the results that we've had so far. So in the interest of time, I'll summarize the slide by saying that endangered large whale species found in New York are a priority for the state. Uh, state management plans highlight the need for whale surveys and whale monitoring is its own action in the New York Ocean Action Plan. Specifically, that plan calls for three years of baseline monitoring as a starting point, and that is the portion that has been completed so far. So our surveys produced a lot of data, so I'm going to try to break down some of these results by using the five W's here. The only difference is I'll be starting with what instead of who to set the stage with how the surveys were conducted. In general, we wanted to look at abundance, which would fall under who, the distribution of these whales for where, uh, and um, the occurrence for when, with an emphasis on recording any behavior seen, which would fall under why. So using information collected in an expert's workshop in 2014, the state determined that a combination of monthly aerial surveys and 24-7 passive acoustic monitoring was the best way forward. These methods each have their own pros and cons, but it's helpful to keep in mind that in both cases, a whale can be present and not recorded. The priority species were the six endangered, at the time, large whale species. In 2016, the population of humpback whales that occurs in this region was delisted from the endangered species list, but humpbacks were and still are priority species. So we have a focus on blue, fin, North Atlantic right, say, sperm, and humpback whales in the monitoring program. The aerial survey design was 15 transect lines perpendicular to Long Island, spanning the entire offshore planning area. And the passive acoustic survey design used 15 acoustic receiver sites parallel to two of the three shipping lanes going into the port of New York, New Jersey. Four of the receivers that were used were capable of recording sound at a higher frequency, and these were included to address sperm whale presence since baleen whales vocalize at a lower frequency. Tetratech uh, was contracted to do the aerial survey and Cornell University's bioacoustics lab did the passive acoustic monitoring. 
both surveys started in 2017 and wrapped in 2020. So all six species were recorded by both methods. This slide is showing the aerial survey results by the number of groups and number of individuals cited. So we had 318 groups of 629 individuals. Humpback whales were the most frequently seen large whale species, followed closely by fin whales. Sperm whales in North Atlantic right whales were found to be consistently present, but in lower numbers. Blue whales and say whales appear to be relatively sporadic. Uh, both species were seen less than five times each. Um, some notable sightings from um, the aerial survey include species that were seen with calves, uh, which were sperm, humpback, and fin whales. A uh, juvenile blue whale was sighted, which is in the top right corner there. A group of six say whales, and there were also some multiple species aggregations, which usually involved humpback and or fin whales, and I'll talk more about those later. Um, so for who, it also includes the identification of individual animals. Uh, researchers at the New England Aquarium were able to identify 11 individual right whales, uh, two of which are in the photo there on the right. Those two are Palmetto and Giza. They're both breeding adult females, two of the less than 70 breeding female right whales that are left. Uh, Palmetto's last calf was in 2020 and Giza's last calf was in 2021. This slide is to acknowledge the presence of all of these species acoustically. Each spectrogram, uh, which is a visual representation of sound, documents detections for each of these species. And I just want to draw your attention to the differences in frequency range that each species vocalizes at. If you look at the middle row in particular, the sperm whale frequency is two to four kilohertz, while the blue whale spectrogram frequency is 10 to 20 hertz, which is orders of magnitude lower. Uh, the figure at the bottom helps put these species differences into context within the marine acoustic environment, and I think Erica will be getting into this more in a little bit. So, where were whales seen and detected? The short answer is pretty much everywhere. Um, both of these figures include all three years of data collected by both methods. In the acoustic figure, the black circles represent the percent presence at each recording site. So the larger the black circle, the more present that species was there. Um, if we take a closer look at the acoustic maps, you'll see that humpback whales were consistently present, um, except for that site closest to the harbor. You'll also see that fin whales were detected at all sites, but with increasing presence as you get farther offshore. Say whales and blue whales were detected at offshore sites, and sperm whales were detected at all four sites that had the higher frequency recorders, including the uh, site closest to the harbor. The aerial survey map on the right shows one symbol per survey year that represents all six species. So you can see that all symbols are generally spread all across the bite, um, but we can take a closer look at each species individually and within different parts of the bite. So the colored zones here are a way to look at different habitat classes and where these species occur within the bite. So from north to south, we have the near shore, the continental shelf, the slope, and the abyssal plain. And you'll see some species specific trends, the most noticeable of which is probably the sperm whale. All of our sperm whale sightings were at the shelf break and into the abyssal plain. Humpback and fin whales were detected in all habitat classes, as were right whales. And blue whales and say whales, much like the acoustic detections, were seen primarily offshore. Moving along to when whales are present. Uh, these figures on the left of the aerial survey results show a few things. Uh, the first is that whales are consistently present throughout the year. 
So while there is an increase in sightings in the summer, we still see a steady presence of whales in the other seasons. Second is a uh, species specific trends. So again, um, things change per species. So right whales weren't seen in summer. Blue whales were only seen in winter. Uh, humpbacks had the most sightings in all seasons, uh, except for spring when fin whales were the most frequently sighting species. The top bar graph shows that most of the six species are present in April and that across all species, sightings were highest in June and lowest in November. And lastly, the bottom graph there shows interannual variation in the sighting rate for each species in each survey year. Um, I know this is a little dense, but as you can see, the, um, there's a huge increase in fin whales and humpback whales in year two, where those blue bars are. And sightings in the summer of 2018 included dozens and dozens of feeding humpbacks and fin whales, which I'll talk more about shortly, but that seems to be where most of the inflation for year two comes from. On the right for the passive acoustic figure, um, again, is some interannual variation in the days of presence per week for each species and each survey year. Uh, blue whales are mostly here in winter with a February peak. Um, humpbacks and fin whales don't really track too closely between years, um, but they are present all months of the year. Right whale presence appears to have two peaks, one in the late fall winter around December and another in April. And importantly, they're still here through the summer, which is something that the aerial survey data did not reflect. Say whales seem to peak presence in April, which does match the aerial survey findings um, as both sightings of say whales were in April. So we can start to see some species specific patterns in when different whales are here in the bay. So for why um, the aerial survey data provides a good first look into why whales are here in the bite. And I'll kind of work through these behaviors that are listed here. Um, for feeding, we had fin, humpback, and right whale sightings for feeding. There was one right whale feeding sighting, but for fin and humpback whales, we had feeding sightings in all three years. Some of those sightings were actually in the shipping lanes. Um, and the bottom left and middle photos there show examples from the June 2018 sightings that I mentioned before. So on the left, you have two bubble nut feeding groups of humpback whales. And just to the right of that, there are four lunge feeding fin whales in there. Uh, the bottom left hand corner is an example of some of the schools of menhaden that were seen during the aerial survey as well. So actually 40% of humpback whale sightings during the aerial survey were of foraging, and those feeding groups can include up to 52 uh, animals each, and they were either lunge feeding or bubble net feeding as shown in the picture. Um, quickly, the socializing, all species were seen in groups of more than one. Uh, there's one sighting of two right whales socializing with uh, constant body contact close to shore in the middle right-hand photo there. Uh, right above that is four of the group of six say whales, and in that sighting there was a lot of sustained belly-to-belly -belly contact, so we can't necessarily rule out um, mating, so that's why the question mark is there. It could be a possibility. For nursing, almost a quarter of sperm whale sightings were included at um, included at least one calf and or juvenile and nursing was noted and photographed in multiple sightings, which you can see right there um, on the top left corner. Um, and of course, some whales were seen just resting and migrating through. I know I'm over time, so I'll go quickly. Um, some of these um, takeaways are, um, the who is pretty straightforward. So all six large whale species can be found in the New York bite. Uh, they were all recorded with both methods. Um, humpback whales and fin whales are here year round and can occur in all corners of the bite. 
And if we combine both of these data sets um, and what they're telling us so far, the right whales and sperm whales are here year round as well. Um, so the when and where of whales here in the bite is generally species specific, but overall summer is peak presence, fall is lowest presence. And then again, noting that species presence and or abundance uh, can change considerably from year to year. As I mentioned earlier, whale monitoring is written into the Ocean Action Plan as a specific need. Um, it's included as an ongoing and evolving effort with both focused research and repeating these three years of surveys every five years to keep track of all of these basic aspects of whale presence in the bite over time. Um, our next phase will hopefully be occurring late 2024, early 2025. We have some funding from Oceans and Great Lakes for another three years of continued aerial and passive acoustic monitoring. Uh, they will be amended because our funding amount is actually half of uh, what we had for the first round of three years. Um, so we'll be doing aerial surveys every other month and passive acoustic monitoring will reduce from 15 sites to seven sites, but we'll continue to um, collect data and add to this um, great data set that we've already started. And that's all I have. Oh, that's great, Megan. Thank you. And I just want everyone to know, uh, no one else has seen this presentation. So, <laughs> so you you really have uh, information right now hot off the press. So that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Megan. Um, we do have a request from somebody saying, um, can I get the slides? Um, I think that was Bobby. Bobby, if you email me, I'd be happy to um, provide them as long as it's okay with the agencies. Okay, our next speaker. Uh, is Dr. And this is encompasses a lot of the questions I'm seeing in the chat about sound impact and whales. But that's why we're delighted to have Dr. Erica Stadman with us, who is a PhD scientist in bio bioacoustician, as it is called. Um, I don't know many of them. In fact, I think that Dr. Stadman is the only one I do know. But she is um, with the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management Center for Marine Acoustics. We're very happy to have you here, and I know people are very anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Erica. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, I am a bioacoustician, so today I'm going to be focusing on what we know about underwater noise from offshore wind and potential impacts to whales. But before we do that, I just want to start by saying that we understand and respect people's concerns about these whales. It's a painful subject, and nobody likes to see whales washing up on the beaches, that's for sure. Um, the reason that people like me work at a place like Boehm is because we really do care, and we want to make sure that all of the activity going on out there has the least possible impact on marine species. I also want to acknowledge that not only do whales represent a keystone species for our oceans, but they also have deep cultural importance, especially for many Native American tribes along the Atlantic coast, where whales are intrinsically connected to their culture, history, beliefs, and practices. So I just felt it was important to acknowledge this before I launch into the science. All right, so I just want to start by defining a few terms that I believe have been causing some confusion in recent media. So under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, you may have heard the word take. And I want to state that take does not necessarily equal kill. Now you can say that that you can see here that under the definition it does include that, but there the type of take that we're going to be focusing on today is harassment, not mortality. So in general, for BOEM activities, very little uh, lethal take is ever authorized by NOAA, and for offshore wind in particular, no lethal take is being authorized. That's typically reserved for things like Navy exercises where they're using explosives in the water. Okay, so for now, let's put lethal take out of our minds, and I want to focus on incidental take or harassment of small numbers of marine mammals, which can be authorized by NOAA for activities like offshore wind development. Okay. So there are two types of incidental take we need to focus on. The first one we call level A, and this would be injury. Now, from an acoustic perspective, this would be permanent hearing loss. So this is a sound that's so loud that it could cause permanent loss of hearing. And National Marine Fisheries Service defines the threshold at which we expect that permanent hearing loss to occur. I want to note that this differs by hearing group, and that's because not all marine mammals hear in the same way. So there are spe special, special thresholds for each hearing group. Now, level B is what we're really going to be focusing on today. And for from the acoustic perspective, this is behavioral disturbance. So this would be a sound that is so disturbing that it would interrupt natural behaviors of a whale. 
Okay. It could also include temporary hearing loss. So this is uh, like when you go to a really loud concert and you can't really hear well for the couple hours afterwards, but then that's recovered the next day. So that's temporary hearing loss. And for all marine mammal species, we use a threshold of 160 decibels relative to one micropascal. And I'm sorry that I don't have time to define acoustic terms today, but there's plenty of information about this on the NOAA website. So really today we're going to be focusing on this level B behavioral harassment threshold. Okay. So now I just want to talk a little generally about marine mammal hearing. So what you can see across this top here is that we have the general hearing ranges of marine mammal species and a couple other species as well. And the horizontal axis here is frequency or pitch of a given sound. So our baleen whales are considered to be low frequency cetaceans. That means that they hear lower frequency sounds than adonocetes, the toothed whales, which are mid and high frequency animals. Okay, so this is a generalized schematic of hearing ranges of marine species. But then now I'm bringing in a lot of anthropogenic sound sources. And I know there's a lot to, to unpack here. I'm not going to go through all of them. I just want to draw your attention to a couple. Generally, I've classified these with the louder sources at the top and the quieter ones along the bottom. I want to draw your attention to some of the most impactful high energy sound sources, which are seismic air guns and Navy sonars. And these sources have been implicated in some more severe interactions with marine mammals, including mortality. But for our purposes today, we are focusing on what we call high resolution geophysical sources. These are uh, circled in purple here. So these are the type of sound sources that are used to map the seafloor. And they're generally much lower in energy and have some really key acoustic characteristics that set them apart from things like seismic air guns. So for offshore wind site characterization, they are not using seismic air guns. That, that is used under BOEMS programs, but that's just for oil and gas. I want to emphasize that the key characteristics about these sounds are really important because not all sound sources produce sound equally, as you can see here just from this one schematic, and not all animals hear equally. So certain animals can't even hear certain sound sources, just the way we, for example, can't hear a dog whistle, but our dogs can. The reason that we have an entire acoustic center at Bohm is just devoted to the complexity of this topic. So there are a lot of really important things to focus on, and I'm going to try to give you a really high level overview today. I do want to state that there's no evidence that the HRG sources used by these offshore wind companies could be causing the mortality of these whales, and there's also no evidence that they're responsible for the recent strandings. So let's talk a little bit about these HRG sources. The reason they're called high resolution geophysical is because they're deliberately designed to map either things in the water column to image the water column on the seafloor or a couple hundred meters below the seafloor. So that's very different than seismic air guns, which are deliberately designed to penetrate kilometers into the seafloor. So those are much more powerful sources by design. Again, offshore wind is not using seismic air guns. Many of the HRG sources are also considered to be non-impulsive. Again, different than seismic air guns, which are impulsive. And the important thing to keep in mind is that impulsive sources generally are thought to be more damaging to auditory tissues of animals because they have a really rapid rise in acoustic pressure. So other than two sources that are called boomers and sparkers, we do not see impulsive sources used by uh, offshore wind during site characterization. Another key thing is that they're intermittent, which means they come on and off during different parts of a survey, and they have low duty cycles. So that means that they're on for really short pulses with a relatively longer period of silence in between, and that's while they're waiting for that return signal. So this little schematic diagram shows, for example, a source that's emitting sound in a narrow cone directed down at the seafloor, and then it waits for that return signal, and that's the way that these sources work. And finally, many of them are directional. So they're not radiating sound equally in all directions, but rather they're typically emitting sound in narrow cones or fan-shaped beams directed right down at the seafloor. So again, really key characterization characteristics about these sound sources. And my colleagues and I recently published a peer-reviewed paper where we did a really deep dive on this. And we went through each of the sound sources used across these different industries and whether or not we thought they could rise to the level of behavioral harassment for marine mammals. So again, that's that 160 dB criterion that I mentioned earlier. This paper is open access. I have a link to it at the end. It is highly technical. So today what I'm actually going to do is show you a video that we produced, which is a complement to the paper that's really meant to just give you that overview of the main findings and why we believe that these sources, the HRG sources, are not likely to result in incidental harassment. Okay. So let's see, hopefully this is gonna work.
People use underwater sound as a tool for exploring the ocean, such as mapping geological features on and beneath the sea floor, measuring the number of fish, and finding appropriate places for the construction of wind turbines. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, analyzes these sounds to determine how and where they should be used in order to avoid harassment of marine species. Two U.S. laws, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, require specific protocols to avoid or minimize harassment of marine animals. Regulatory agencies provide guidance on acoustic limits. If the sound level is above the threshold when it reaches an animal, it may result in behavioral harassment of that individual. If an animal is exposed to a sound below the limit, it would not be considered harassed. We classify these sound sources as de minimis, meaning they have minimal impact on marine species. These thresholds are useful, but they only focus on how loud the sound is and do not include other important characteristics of the sound source. A recent study completed by BOEM and the USGS closely examined high-resolution geophysical sources that are typically used to map the seafloor. The study characterized and classified a suite of sound sources based on their potential to affect marine species. The first characteristic was the frequency, or pitch, of the sound. Some resources transmit sounds that are above the hearing range of most marine mammals and are considered de minimis simply because the animals cannot hear them. The second factor is the amplitude, or how loud the sound is when it reaches an animal. Normally, the amplitude is defined as the source level from the device generating the sound. But sounds lose energy with distance, so by the time they reach an animal, the received level could be below the threshold, meaning the source is not impactful. Also, it's unlikely that a marine mammal will encounter an area where sound levels are high or significantly disturbing. Even in areas with very high densities of marine mammals, calculations show that a single individual would rarely receive high sound levels. This indicates that some louder sounds may be considered de minimis under most conditions. The width of the sound beam is also an important consideration in determining the impact of sound sources. Omnidirectional sources radiate sound energy equally in all directions, but many high-resolution geophysical sources have sound beams that are more narrow and only ensonify a small part of the water column. Therefore, some acoustic sources can be considered de minimis because they only ensonify a small volume of water and thus are unlikely to be encountered by a marine mammal. Finally, it's important to consider the total duration of a sound source as it passes by an animal. Many high-resolution geophysical sources emit very short pulses of sounds. The number of pulses relative to the animal's position and the speed of survey vessels are used to determine the total duration of sound that an animal may encounter. Most animals will receive such a short total duration of sound that it can be considered de minimis especially compared to all of the various sources they hear in a typical day. By evaluating these characteristics of active acoustic sources, most high-resolution geophysical sources, such as those used for surveying areas for renewable energy or sand resources, can be considered de minimis and are unlikely to result in harm to marine mammals. The findings of this research help agencies to determine which sources require regulatory review and mitigation such as protected species observers to operate safely around marine species and which sources do not. This provides us with a more complete understanding so that BOEM can confidently deploy high-resolution geophysical systems in support of the agency's mission to manage development of energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. To learn more, visit BOEM.gov. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna get right to the conclusions of the paper here. Um, we did propose a framework where we would put these different sounds into tiers. So you can ignore tiers one and two here. Um, these are for air guns, but the important point is tiers three and four. So we believe that many of the high resolution geophysical sources belong in tier four, meaning that they're unlikely to result in incidental take even without any mitigation that would be applied. 
Some of them could belong in tier three where they'd be no take when certain mitigations are applied. Now, I do wanna say that this is a framework that was proposed in the paper, but currently BOEM is requiring mitigations for both tiers three and four. So what this means is that you have marine mammal observers out there on the water looking around at all times during these surveys. And when an animal comes within a certain radius of that vessel, they're required to shut down the sound source to, re to reduce any impact whatsoever. In addition, they are obliged to report any interaction with a whale. So if, God forbid, they accidentally struck a whale, we certainly would know about that. All of that stuff is reported to BOEM and NOAA, okay? So the conclusions here are that the current mitigations that are used for site characterization should be more than accurate, adequate, rather. There's no evidence that site characterization could be the cause of these whale strandings. None of the companies have been seeking level A harassment authorization for any of the site characterization and actually very little level B as well. NOAA is not authorizing mortality for any offshore wind activity. So we do believe that these findings are adequate and that the, the mitigation should be good in place for now. So what that means is that for BOEM, we have other areas of focus. So some of the things we're focusing on are establishing a multi-year regional monitoring network for baleen whales using passive acoustic methods. We also are looking at a received sound level limit for impact pile driving, which will be the next phase of offshore wind development and a number of other relevant topics. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions about this. I don't have time to go into it further. I do just want to draw your attention to the full citation for our paper. Like I said, it's open access. It is very technical, but you are most welcome to read it, as well as another document we recently produced in our acoustic center, which is a sound source list, which describes in a sort of encyclopedia level detail, a description of all of the sounds used across BOEM's program. So these are really great resources to learn more about underwater sound and potential impacts. And here I just have my email address as well, as well as our CMA website, if you want to find out more about our work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate it. That was great. Lots of information. And you talk almost as quickly as I do. Um, okay, so I'll, next speaker, but I just want to make a commercial announcement here. I'm getting lots of emails um, and requests, a couple of text messages that people are sending me their emails saying, send me the slides. What we're going to do instead of sending them all out individually, um, which is a lot because there's almost 400 people on this uh, on this forum, is that we will um, post them on the website for WindWorks Long Island. So we will post the recording of this forum as well as the slides um, that people used. But last but not least, let me introduce uh, Robert or Rob Diagiovanni. Um, some of you know him as the whale guy because whenever there's a whale stranding or even a dolphin, large turtle, uh, Rob and his crew and his team are there working to either help the species or unfortunately to do what's called a necropsy. So with his 33 years of experience, Rob, you're on. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. I appreciate the time to be able to speak with you all about this. And I, I want to once again, start off by not only thanking the other panelists, but also thanking the public for their concern. I mean, in the 33 years we've been out there looking at animals and looking at causes of mortality, it's real easy to think that we're out there alone. But seeing the people that we were able to engage with uh, while we're out there, seeing their concerns really is um, definitely reassuring and helps us through those uh, cold days. We could not do this alone. And so although um, I get to speak to you on behalf of some of the work that's been being done, um, it's no, it's not done by one individual, it's done by a team of people. And I, I can't thank all of our partners in the network. Uh, the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society is one of the two organizations that are responsible for responding to whales, dolphins, seals, and sea turtles in New York. Uh, the other organization is New York Marine Rescue, and they focus on um, the rehabilitation of uh, seals and sea turtles. Whereas um, back in 2016, uh, we created the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society to start looking at the causes of mortality of these events and trying to get those information to the public uh, by promoting marine conservation through action. So we have a number of projects that we work on. But today we're here to really talk about the whales that we've been seeing and some of the trends that we've we've occurred and have been occurring. Uh, just to give a little bit of a background, I've started over 30 years ago. Um, I conducted aerial surveys in the New York Bite and worked with NOAA Fisheries conducting aerial surveys throughout this area. When the occurrence of animals uh, was not as much as we're seeing right now, to the point where when we used to fly, we used to look at those, the photo that you saw of Megan uh, or that Adrian put out about the 
humpback whale in the middle of all that debate, we used to actually just count the number of bait balls that we saw when we were flying. So I put that out there just to look at the changes where we could count individual bait balls. Now they're just large amounts of food out there. So it's a very different environment than what we saw two decades ago. Um, so some of these whale strandings that we see are, are focused on um, a number of different species and, and how has that changed um, is really what we want to look at and look at the frequency of changing. That's what got us thinking about this a number of years ago when I presented some of these data um, a while back, and it was um, October of 2017. Um, and as I was presenting these data, I looked at the frequency of strandings. And you can see from this graph, um, we saw what we did is we looked at the actual number of animals that we had, but then we looked at a three-year rolling average and they kind of match up uh, pretty well to give you an idea of what's happening. What I wanted to point out here with this graph is that prior to 2007, um, we used to get, you know, one whale stranding every so often. I think the average was about 133 days between events um, with the longest stretch of about 617 days between events there. So it didn't happen as regular as we wanted. We also didn't have um, a lot of sightings. Actually, at that point in time, the most commonly heard comment when we were out on the beach and engaging with the public and talking to them was, I didn't know that we had whales here. Um, and so we would talk about, hey, well, do you understand that we know we had whaling that occurred from these ports? We knew that we saw enough whales from shore years ago. Um, and so it was a really good opportunity for us to educate public about what was going on historically and how we're seeing those changes. What you might notice is that as of 20, uh, 2007, we started to see an increase in the number of strandings where we would get one to three a year. And so that was kind of changing a little bit. The average time was about 109 days between events. Um, and then in 2016, when we were looking at this in 2017, um, at the time of, of my initial assessment of this, it was October, 2017. And at that point in time, um, we looked at the frequency of strandings for that year. And we were seeing a, an average of a whale stranding every 63 days. By the end of that year, we were seeing an average whale stranding uh, on an average of 28 days. And that's kind of what carried us through for the, for the next couple of uh, years is that we started to see this, this large increase. And that's what also um, led NOAA to declaring unusual mortality events for a number of species. Um, so there's an, an unusual mortality event for the North Atlantic right whale. There's an unusual mortality event for the humpback whale, as well as for the minke whale. So we have three different species of whales um, if you remember from Megan's slide earlier, she gave a list of a number of species. Um, but you have three species of whales that are undergoing an unusual event, which would mean that something is occurring at a different frequency or in a specific area. To put them all in perspective, since the beginning of these unusual mortality events, there was there have been uh, 300, over 360 whales that have been reported in the Northwest Atlantic from Florida to Maine uh, that have been washed up and, and examined. What I'm gonna do for the rest of this talk is really focus on the ones that are in the New York bite or the ones that we've really responded to and give a little bit of, of a story to talk about what are the causes of mortality that we are seeing um, and some of the factors that we might encounter as we go forward. Um, I just wanna also pause here for a second to, to point out that of those 360, about 30 to 38% of them were in the New York bite. So it's still, it's it's not all the animals, they are spread up out over a much larger area, but the issues that we see here are issues that we're seeing up and down the coast as well. And I do apologize, I know I talk fast, so I'm trying to slow that down. Um, so just to put this in perspective here, two, two maps, the one on the left is giving you an idea of the strandings of large whales, uh, which would, would be the ones that Megan showed you earlier. Um, from Rhode Island down to New Jersey, we work with our network partners from Mystic Aquarium and the Marine Mammal Stranding Center um, and, and people from all over. When we're conducting these examinations, we work under the authorization of NOAA Fisheries uh, to try and answer some of these questions. The two main issues from this these two maps would be looking at the red circles here, which are the occurrence of humpback whales. And you can see that most of them are following obviously the coastline but not all of them. Some of these animals are occurring offshore, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the black boxes here are actually minke whale strandings, and what we think is another thing that we want to note here is that we're not only seeing them off the south shore of Long Island or in the New York Bight area, we're also seeing them in Long Island Sound, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. 
And this is just giving you an idea of the distribution of these animals. They're following the same pattern. Um, but I, I would be risk, remiss to point out that when we started, when we worked many years ago with the Okinos Ocean Research Foundation, they used to run whale watches out of Montauk Point, and they used to come out offshore because it was really one of the only places that you were seeing whales on the east end of Long Island. And now, as you can see from Adrian's slide earlier, she pointed out Gotham Whale is running whale watching off, off um, up in the New York Bight in, in, in the area of the Hudson, Hudson Bay area. So in this case here, you're seeing animals all throughout this area, which is really a, a, a change that you have. The next couple of slides are just some graphs giving you an idea of the occurrence of some of these whales throughout the region. You can see that the humpback whale event starting in 2016 um, has kind of been having a large number of whales over the last couple of years. Uh, 2021 was a little bit less of a frequency, uh, but you can see 2022 had a, um, came back up, but we're still in the middle of these unusual mortality events and we're still investigating these causes of mortality. Um, there were 191 humpback whales that actually uh, were stranded during this period of time, and 38% of them were in the New York Bight. What do we find when we examine these animals? We conduct a full examination. I'll show you some slides about that. Uh, leading causes of mortality we're seeing are from vessel strike, and that was going back from 2016, 2017. Um, it's one of the things that we do document, um, but it, it is a process that I'll explain a little bit later. Um, to give you another Example of the Mickey whales, the Mickey whales that we've encountered, you can see the numbers have started to increase in 2017 and 2018. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those occurrences here um, in, in the next couple of slides. But the leading cause of mortality for this or, or leading, leading uh, thought on this, this event is that it's more of a biological or an infectious disease processes. So here we've already explained two different species of whales um, that have had an increase in the number of strandings for two different reasons so far that we're, we're looking at. But I want to pause here for a second and point out, we don't go into these investigations to say, oh, look, this is a cause of mortality. We go into these investigations to examine every animal in, in the same way we do each whale when it comes up. We would hope that we don't do this as frequent, frequently as we do. But since we started Atlantic Marine Conservation Society, um, in 2016 and sort of responded in 2017, we responded to 83 whales. So we couldn't do this without the support of not only you, the public, but the municipalities uh, coming together to help us to provide um, the logistical support and the equipment, the pathology labs. And, and this is just the start. We get a call about an animal and then the process starts of us pulling together teams to be able to go out there. Um, we've spoken about right whales in numerous talks and many people, it's probably i um, talking about a heck of a lot more than any of the other whales, but it just gives you an idea. Um, these all slides came from NOAA Fisheries website, so you can find a lot of those data there. Um, and you can see that it's giving you an idea of the number of animals that we have, the number of documented mortalities. We have had two, um, um, I'm sorry, North Atlantic right whales in the New York Bight in recent years that we've encountered, but it's not the first time that we encountered them. We actually had um, a right whale calf that uh, back in June 18th, 2001, that um, had evidence of being hit by a vessel um, and was just south of Jones Beach. And we were able to go out and do a, conduct a necropsy on that animal as well. Um, so what are the challenges that we face when we go out there? And what are the concerns that we have about, you know, how do we get these animals? Why are we not able to examine every one of these animals? And this gives us an example, sorry for the graphic nature of this photo. Um, I should have said that first. Um, but in this case here, what we have in the top is a humpback whale um, that was reported off of Montauk Point. Um, and you can see here, this is the point we, we worked with the, uh, the Coast Guard. And they actually, um, they basically give us an idea of where the animal is. And then they conduct a drift model to see when the animal um, would come up on shore, how we can get, get access to the animal, it gives us an idea of how we can plan. We were able to go out there. I went out there with the help of the New York State DEC, and we were able to affix uh, a tag to the animal. And so we track the animal and that's the bottom right here. You can see the animal's movement throughout this. This occurred over about a week's time. So what's important to note in this part of the equation is, is that it would have been a week from the time that we initially sighted the animal to the time when we actually get to investigate if the animal is accessible. In this case, the animal was not accessible and we were not able to do this. 
but we also want to put into the equation that that's a week longer that the animal is decomposing. So um, it's very difficult to get samples from that. But also remember that these animals, um, when they die, they will sink to the bottom and they will only start to become positively buoyant when they float to the surface because of uh, decomposition. So usually when we encounter an animal, it has already undergone um, considerable decomposition in order for it to show up on the beaches and makes it very difficult in a lot of these cases not only from that part, but also from accessibility. Uh, I want to point out, Adrian alluded to this, this event earlier, the humpback whale in July 2020. Uh, when we thought about it, starting Atlantic Marine Conservation Society, the idea was to be able to start looking at these events if they start to increase and be prepared to provide logistical support. Um, Atlantic Marine Conservation Society received the call about an animal that was entangled. You might see in the top right where you can just see the rostrum of this humpback whale coming out. We went out with the New York State DEC to go and assess the animal, assess that it was there. We worked with the Center for Coastal Studies to help provide logistical support over this four-day event where they were able to disentangle this animal from this, this debris here. This is 3,900 pounds a gear that the animal was treading water on for four days. Um, we feel this very significant because this animal was actually born the same year that we decided to form the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society with hopes that we can be there to try and respond to this. So this is another cause of mortality that we have seen. Why I wanted to emphasize this event was because during this four day event, we did not get very many calls about an animal that was out there. We had few calls and this is where we need the public's help, not only to report when you see an animal that's in distress, but also when you see animals that are out there that are, that are free swimming and healthy so we can understand how this relates to the wild population. You might, Remember this animal here that just came up. This was a humpback whale called Luna. It was a 44-year-old animal. It was an adult male. Um, and from the work of Dr. Uh, Julie Stepanek, uh, she did her PhD work at Stony Brook University. Um, she had documented that she's seen more larger whales um, and adult animals offshore. And what we see from strandings is we usually see them closer, uh, see the juveniles or the animals that are around 30 feet long uh, closer to shore. Why do I bring this up is because we do have changes in our environment on a seasonal basis that we still need to get a better understanding on. Some of the years that we have, um, we might have animals closer to shore. We might have more animals feeding. We might have animals that are encountering um, being in the shipping lanes. And we need to understand how those dynamics change. There was a paper that was um, in one of, at the end of um, Megan's talk where they were talking about the occurrence of sperm whales. Well, occurrence of sperm whales um, was documented by the Okinos Research Foundation um, from the Whale Watch boat um, on, the, on the shelf as a rare occurrence back in the 90s. And it doesn't happen all the time, but we are seeing these changes. Um, I want to emphasize that also this part this is only the beginning of the investigation. You can see the amount of equipment that's needed. This is one of the animals that we'll be working with our colleagues at the Marine Mammal uh, Stranding Center in New Jersey. Uh, this animal was transported off site so that a uh, full examination could occur. Um, and this is an animal back, in, another humpback in Rockaway in April of 2017, where we go out and we collect life history data to understand the, the um, size of the animals. And then you can see Kim Dorham, our necropsy team leader here, is examining um, any of uh, the old, older wounds that they might have had from entanglements. And then we conduct an internal examination from this. And from this, what I really would like us to, to take home from this, with all of the work that we did um, and these 83 animals uh, that we've responded to since 2017, 17 of these animals, uh, large whales, have been alive, which is a change that we've incurred. Most of them have actually been the um, minke whales. Um, and of those 83, 56 have, have had necropsies that were conducted on them. 35 had evidence of human um, interaction. And then 24 of those had suspect vessels, right? We have not documented any link between uh, wind, wind energy or, or uh, processing like that um, with the, the mortality of these animals. We are seeing what we've seen historically with vessel strikes. We have seen whale strandings during all months of the year. Um, and we have seen that in the, since 2017 to now, uh, as well as historically. We, so we have a, had animals occurring on, on this basis. They, we are also seeing a lot more animals. And the key thing here is that we're not only seeing a lot more animals, but we're seeing a lot more animals doing this and feeding. And when I look at it, I always emphasize the fact 
when we have animals coming through here, if we have food here, you're probably going to have them slowing, slowing down more and feeding more and spending more time here. So do we have more whales? We have more whales spending more time here. That's the question that we, we grapple with. I think about it. If I'm at a buffet um, and there's food, I might stay there longer. If there's no food, I'm not going to hang out and I'll move on to the next, to the next uh, course. So when we have these animals, we know that at one point in time, there were enough animals here way back in whaling days that you saw enough animals that you used to be able to row out from a dugout canoe to go whaling. Well, now we're starting to see an increase in these animals and it's important for us to understand the dynamics associated with how they're changing in the environment, as well as documenting what the causes of these mortalities are. Thank you. I don't know You're how I right. did it on time, Adrian. I no, it was excellent. Thank you. There was a lot of great information in there. And, and for all our presenters, that's exactly um, the questions we've been getting from the public, um, you know, for the last several months. And, and you guys have helped answer a lot. Not everything, because, you know, we, we can't do everything in one forum here. But um, I just want to extend this another 10 minutes, if it's okay with our, our panel, um, just to get a few questions in. The Question and answer is very lively. Um, just just a quick couple of them, okay? Um, I think one of you said 360 strandings across the seaboard. And what period of time was that from? I think the answer, and Rob or, or Erica, tell me if it's wrong, that was from 2016 uh, till now. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, good. There, these data are, are on the NOAA website. Okay. Uh, Matt Grove. From uh, Surf Riders wants to know. He said there was a UME for whales in twenty uh, in two thousand and six. Do we know what caused that? Uh, actually, um, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, in that case, there we were not able to get uh, many samples from the animals. We even looked for um, uh, when we tried to get stomach context to, to look for domoic acid, and we had some some indication of domoic acid, uh, but. We don't have any baseline information. So we've been able to uh, increase the number of samples that we've been able to select. So in many of these cases for unusual mortality events, uh, the answer might be undetermined because we're not able to sample as many animals. Good question, how do you Thank you. So, Rob, can you tell folks, how do you dispose of the remains of a whale? That's always a question we get at our office too from people. Yeah, it's a um, really good question. Thank you for uh, asking. Um, there's a number of ways that we do this. Uh, in one case, I'm, you know, one of the most common practices is that we show up on the beach, we have heavy equipment, um, and then we'll conduct the necropsy, um, and then we'll bury the animal uh, on site and and leave the animal there. Another was, as, as you saw in the uh, Maui, New Jersey animal, um, that animal was actually carted off and to, an, to another site or to a, a landfill. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that we can respond respond to these animals and, and be able to sample them. The key thing here is there have also been times when they've taken them offshore. When they take them offshore, then we're not able to examine the animals, you know, to the extent that we would like. So we prefer to be able to at least examine this. And, you know, I always, I want to make sure we're all clear. We would rather not have to examine these animals, you know, because they don't come up. So one of the questions that was asked, and I think is really important right now, is about what the experience is with in, in Europe, because we obviously don't have very many wind farms here now. We have no no pile drive is taking place in New York at this point in time, and we only have the five turbines off off of um, Rhode Island. So uh, you know, do you have? Do any of you have data um, or experience of what's happened with with whale mortality relative to offshore wind? Uh, or not in the North Atlantic. So I don't know, Megan or Rob or Erica, if any of you have looked at that. Well, I'm just going to punt to Erica and just say that I think that they look, you can answer the part. I can talk about the mortality part if you want, or I can just take it all. It's up to you, Erica. I don't want to. Let's do um, a quick one. Yeah. You go ahead. Say what you got to say, and I'll fill in whatever's left. So I think one of the things that's different about um, what's going on over in Europe with, with looking at wind energy is the difference of, of baleen whales that we have. We don't have the occurrence. There's been work that's been done with harbor porpoise and seals to look at how they might um, imp be impacted or change their behavior or move. Um, but as far as dealing with the baleen whales, that issue is, is still relatively new. 
Yep, that's correct. And a lot of the research in Europe has focused on acoustic impacts to those toothed whales because that's what occurs there. So they have really been focused on a different um, group of hearing specialists than what we have here, at, like Rob said, the baleen whales, which are low frequency hearers. So it's a different set of issues, though there are some lessons learned that we can gain. We're getting a lot of questions about entanglement. Uh, lots of people ask the question, is there anything being done to reduce entanglement from commercial fishing gear? Well, I can say that there's a lot that's being done in the sense of being able to report this. The Center for Coastal Studies does, you know, has a disentanglement team. They work with NOAA Fisheries to work on no, I think they mean prevent it. Okay. Prevent it. Yeah. Well, I so know the next you part respond of this is that the whales tangled. <laughs> yeah. Th so there's there's effort to look at, you know, the line in the water. How do we reduce that? There's a number of fishing um, efforts that are going in to try and mitigate those. It's not something that we work in directly. That's where I was going, is you know, NOAA Fisheries and that group are working to try and mitigate those occurrences. So one of the questions we have is, is how we can reduce ship strikes. And earlier, I know there was a question about, is this something that, that can be done and who's responsible for that? Um, I believe the answer is it's the federal government, not a state issue on as far as like who's in charge of like the shipping industry from that perspective. Um, I don't know if Erica, you want to add anything to that? I mean, it's it's something that, you know, is, is being looked at right now. And there's, I think, a, a proposed rule on this. But as Adrian noted in one of the responses to a, a Q and a you know, there is a lot of reluctance and, and pushback from the shipping industry on slowing um, shipping speeds, for example. By reluctance, we mean powerful lobbying. Go ahead, Erica. <laughs> um, the only thing, yeah, so the, the vessel speed rule um, and a regulation of any vessels not related to offshore wind falls under NOAA's purview, not BOEMS, but I can say that we have vessel speed restrictions in place for offshore wind related vessels. So they will be required to go very slowly going out and back to their sites and also during these surveys that we mentioned. So we're doing everything we can from the NOAA pers from the BOEM perspective, but the rest is on NOAA. So would you say currently that the shipping industry has faster speeds than offshore wind industry will be required to comply with? I believe that's true, yes. I mean, in certain areas, all vessels are required to slow down, but um, we're being really strict with our requirements for the offshore wind vessels. Gotcha. The other question we're getting is, um, what are the other Can I just answer that one second, though? Oh, I'm sorry, Rob. Just, yes, Rob. I just want to add one, one other part. I'm sorry. Is that the other part about how we do that is the increased awareness. So like Megan was talking about, being able to do surveys to know that these animals are here, looking at those changes is really important, and also making sure that, you know, we have a couple hundred people on here knowing that whales are in the in this area and report what you're seeing. Those data do help inform. When we know that there are whales in the area, then we also know that we might have to slow down. So I think that that type of information and those data are really important, and that's where the public does help. Rob, I think if you can just reiterate where people should report that to, because that was one of the questions that was in the Q&A as well. Well, and that's a really good question, and we will definitely send that out because I don't want to just promote what we do at AMCs, but we do have a sighting network that um, people um, can send to sightings at amseas.org, and then we report those, and when we get a number of them, we work with Megan. Um, there's also, um, I know Megan has, uh, New York State DEC has a, re a sighting point, but we could get that information out to everybody. Does that sound fair? Yes. And speaking of getting information out, I, I'm still getting emails and text messages about getting the presentations. Again, we will post that on Windworks Long Island website. Give us a couple of days or at least one day. We'll have a copy of this recording and we'll have a copy of the presentations for easy access for everybody, uh, for everybody. Um, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. We are going to have to end it there. I know there's there's so many questions in the chat. We, we actually did not expect so many people. We had almost 400 people participate today, which we deeply appreciate. Um, we may do this again and look at your questions and see uh, how we can gear the next lecture to answer the many good questions that people answered. Again, the objective of us today was to get facts and science-based information out there. Um, myths have been running rampant, uh, and that's never good for creating policy. Good science and good common sense create good policy. And that I think is about what we are all about. So thank you so much to our participant, participants. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, Julie Tai and Fred Zulkman. Um, we appreciate everyone's time. Julie, I know you have to catch a train. 
<laughs> so I think we should leave it there. It's already 1.15. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.